Welcome back to Econ 104 Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be continuing on talking about economic growth. Specifically, we're going to be taking a look at our growth models. That is, how exactly do we explain why economic growth happens? What are the prerequisites, if any, for economic growth? So that's our goal for today. We'll be taking a look at a few different models. We'll explain what exactly models mean, like why, why do we create these models? What are they used for? And we'll talk about these prerequisites. So let's jump over. Let's take a look at that. Okay, first, our prerequisite for growth. So let's, uh, let's write that down. This is argued to be our prereq for growth. And keep in mind, when we're talking about economic growth, what we're talking about primarily is that growth in GDP, uh, real GDP per capita. And so really, when we throw around growth, that's typically what we're referring to. Although, keep in mind, often synonymously, we'll also refer to as economic growth as just growth in real GDP. So sometimes real GDP, sometimes real GDP per capita. We'll try to be, <clears throat> we'll try to be explicit in what we mean by growth as we carry on. So first of all, what is thought to be a big prerequisite for growth is that you need a government a government with a monopoly on violence and you might go wow wow that's that's harsh like, you need a government that like why is this violence term throwing up talking about uh, talking about growth well what we mean by this is that you need the government to really be in control and to be able to ultimately this monopoly of violence allows the government to pass and enforce laws, right? That is, you need to have an economy that is governed by the rule of law. And let's go back to this monopoly of violence and talk about why that's needed. If the government does not have a monopoly of violence, a monopoly on violence, the government could try to put in a law saying, hey, you can do this, you cannot do that. But without a monopoly on violence, if they're not the only ones that are legally allowed to use force or the only ones that do use force within a nation, there's no enforcement of that. It could just simply be, hey, I've put in a bunch of effort. I've created this new thing. You take a look at that thing and you go, wow, that's pretty cool. I have a really big stick. I'm just going to come along with my stick. I'm going to beat you with it and I'm going to take that thing from you. Right? If there's many people or if there's many competing factions within an economy that all have the ability to utilize violence for their own gain, well, we don't necessarily have a good kind of situation a good social contract in place to allow growth or even really a functioning economy to take place if a government is able to have a monopoly on violence that is they're the only ones who get to exercise force and ideally the government does so underneath their own rule of law that is hey everybody in the nation everyone in the economy knows what is and what is not allowed you're not like oh I hope the police don't just come pick me up today. I don't think I did anything wrong, but I'm not really too sure. No, no, no. We have very clear laws. The government is bound by those laws. The police are bound by those laws. We all know what they are, and they're commonly understood and followed. In that case there, through this rule of law, because of this monopoly on violence, and most importantly, because of property rights, that is what we are and what we are not allowed to own, we can begin to have a stable, functioning, working economy in order to, hey, once we have this functioning, stable, working economy, we can begin to accumulate wealth, we can begin to invest in ourselves, invest in our future, and see some growth in the economy. So some basic prerequisites for growth. And ultimately, these really are prerequisites for a basic functioning economy as well. You might have seen this in micro if you had taken that or looked at that. Okay, outside of that, let's go take a look at our first kind of models for economic growth. And really, why do, why do we have models? Why do we use models? Why do we use models? Well, what a model ultimately is, is it's an abstraction, it's a simplification from reality to try to explain the world around us. That is, we know it's not perfect, we know there's assumptions being made, 
but it allows us to quickly, sometimes not so quickly, but quicker than if we looked at what was going to happen just by letting it play out, is we can kind of evaluate and we can kind of make some predictions or some explanation as to why we are where we are or where we think we might end up. So modeling allows us to abstract from reality to kind of bring it into a simpler form and to use this simpler form to try to have some explanation as to what might be. So our first model we're going to be taking a look at, our first model utilizes production function. And if you saw this production function in micro, you probably saw it something along the lines of this, such as, hey, Q is in some quantity, some output, was just some function given technology of our labor and our capital. That is often how you saw this production function in micro. And really all it's saying is, hey, our output, the stuff we're producing, is some function of labor and capital for some technology that we have. What's that functional form? Ah, there's many different versions out there, one of which would be our Cobb-Douglas, which says, hey, output is A times L to the alpha times capital to the beta, and work through it in that way there, just to give it some functional form. That being said, we don't overly need to worry about what that functional form is, what we can take a look at is our production function and we'll say in the macro sense, we'll say that our production function is not looking at Q, which output. In fact, we're gonna look at real GDP, which keep in mind, technically we are trying to measure output. And we're gonna say that this is a function of our technology, our labor, our capital, and we'll throw in a third term, H, which will denote human capital. So human capital, what, what exactly is that? That's going to be our education, our skills, our know-how. That is the ability for labor to grow, to be more productive, to learn. So schooling, right? You're obtaining right now by being in this course is you're obtaining human capital. It's what you're able to add to yourself to increase your employability or to increase your productivity. That's the idea there with human capital. The other ones, just to make sure we're clear, K, that is capital, that's physical capital, that's our tools, our equipment, our machinery, our factories. That's what we mean by capital, our physical capital. And then, of course, L, labor, how many people we have working, how many people we have all together to draw from. So that's what we would have in this case here. This model... Well, what we presume is that as we increase labor, as we increase capital, or as we increase human capital, if we increase any one of these things, we would get an increase in real GDP. So, hey, if we add more people, that is, if we open up our borders, we have massive immigration, more people, or we increase our fertilization or Yep, our fertilization rates, and all of a sudden we have a boom in fertilization fertility rates. We have a drastic increase in our fertility rates, then boom, all of a sudden we have a growth in our population, more workers, more workers means more GDP. If all of a sudden we have massive investment in new capital, we have all these new machines, all this new factories, tools, etc., again, all of this is going to cause a boom in our GDP as well. Finally, if we have a spike in our human capital, our knowledge, our education, our understanding of the world around us, well, that increases our productivity, increases our skills, and again, an increase in our real GDP. What is often presumed in this model as well, though, is that we have diminishing returns. That is, we have diminishing returns. That is, as we increase our labor force, yes, we get more GDP, more GDP, more GDP, but at a diminishing rate. That is, we have this diminishing return to scale for labor. That is, if I went and did two times my labor force, 
it would only do something like, and I'm just going to make up a value here, it would only do something like 1.75 times my real GDP. That is, I wouldn't expect to get a one-for-one one result of output or from input to output. I would have this diminishing return. So as I add more and more and more workers, yes, GDP is still growing, right? We said, hey, labor up, GDP up. That's true, but it's at a diminishing rate. The same could be said if we only did two times capital. Very similar. Let's presume it's the same kind of multiplier here. We could get something like that. And then similarly for human capital. So we have that kind of result happening with this model. At least the assumption that this would be the case. What we also presume is that we would have constant returns. That we would have constant returns if we increase things in proportion. So in our first case, diminishing returns, that was, hey, if I only increased my labor force, I would have that result. Or if I only increased my capital stock, I would have that result. But what would happen if I did two times my labor, my capital, and my human capital? That is, I doubled all of that? Well, in that case there, with constant returns, I would expect to witness two times my real GDP. So in that case there, if everything was increased proportionally, I would have a proportional increase in my output. So some basic kind of ideas with this model here. And so from this sense, we see, hey, why do we have growth? Why are we having this growth over time? Well, we're having this growth over time because we're growing our population. So, hey, as we have more people, more people need more stuff, but more people are also able to produce more stuff. So as we add more labor, well, we get growing GDP. At the same time, all these people, we're also having more businesses, we're also having more machines, more equipment, more tools, all of that being created. All of that is more capital. So, hey, our labor is increasing, our capital is also increasing. So, again, we're getting growth in GDP. Finally, as we move through time, we're ha also having more human capital. We're learning from the mistakes of past generations. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, as it were. We're adding to our knowledge of the world. We're adding to our skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of this, all of these in conjunction, increasing as we move through time. As all of these increase, well, then so does our real GDP. So thus, we see that, hey, growth in labor, growth in capital, growth in human capital all result in higher levels of GDP. But, hey, what about this little guy here? This little T, right? What was that? That there we said was technology. It turns out, interestingly enough, despite, hey, this growth in labor, this growth in capital, this growth in our education, the biggest determinant, the biggest thing that we find that contributes to growing real GDP is growing technology. So we'll come, we'll talk about what exactly we mean by technology in a bit, but Let's just kind of keep that in mind right now that, in fact, despite growing labor, growing capital, growing human capital, growth in technology has been our key determinant for economic growth. And they go really hand in hand with that. But let's tweak this model slightly. Let's tweak this model and see kind of how this changes if we want to focus on economic growth of real GDP per capita. And so let's take a look at that. If we want to take a look at growth of real GDP per capita, so if we presume, hey, everybody in our economy is working or able to work, that is, they're all part of the labor force. That's not true, by the way. In reality, we expect, we typically witness about two thirds of our population to be in the labor force. But simplifying assumption, if we take a look at real GDP per worker, so per capita, we can say, well, that's going to be a function, given our technology per worker, of our workers per worker, our capital per worker, and our human capital per worker. Hey, worker per worker, that just cancels themselves out. So what we get is we get this idea of real GDP per capita 
is some function given our technology per worker, our capital per worker, and our human capital per worker. That is, in this case here, <clears throat> everything is in terms of, hey, how much tools do we have per worker available to us? How much skills, how much education do we have per person? And arguably, the most important aspect here is going to be how much technology do we have available per worker? Again, being that technology is that biggest contributor, biggest determinant of GDP growth as witnessed. Well, in this case here, very similar results. But what we see is that things change a little bit. We see, first of all, is that if we were just to increase our labor force, so if we were just to increase our labor force, ceteris paribus, that means all else constant, everything else in the world is being held constant except for our labor force. Well, hey, keep in mind, labor force is in the denominator here. So if that went up and that went up, this overall term altogether would actually get smaller, meaning that our real GDP per capita would actually shrink. So, okay, if we just increase the amount of people we had, but we didn't give them more tools. We didn't give them access to more technology. We didn't give them access to more education. We just added more people. The result of that would actually be a falling GDP per capita. That is a falling average income, average output, average expenditure within an economy. So, okay, that's kind of our first observation to take away from this changed model. That's kind of a race here, and let's take a look at a few other things. Our next one, what happens if we just increase capital cetris paribus? That is, we increase our capital stock, holding everything else constant. Well, okay, in this case here, if we increase our capital stock, again, that's in our numerator, so bigger numerator would mean bigger overall term. So, hey, as we add more capital, well, very similarly, again, we would get a growth in our GDP per person, a growth in our average income within a nation, our growth within our average expenditure, average output. So, hey, more capital, more stuff being produced. Great. That's awesome. That's what we would want to see. So growth in capital stock, good thing to grow our average income or our income per person. What's our other option here? Other option is to grow our skill sets, to grow our education, our skills, our ability to understand the world, our really human capital can be thought of is how effectively we can utilize capital, right? Imagine throwing a computer in front of somebody who had never seen a computer before, never been trained in one, has no idea how to use the software, the programs, how to turn it on. Well, because you've given them that computer, they're not going to be very productive. They're not going to be very effective with that computer. They're not going to know what to do with it. Okay. You give someone the training. You show them how to use a computer. Now, all of a sudden, that computer, that computer, that's, that's the capital. Right? So we have some fixed amount of computers out there. If we provide that education and that training, now they know how to utilize that computer. They know how to be productive with that computer. And just by that education, that training, all of a sudden we can have an increase in the amount of stuff we're able to produce. Right? For a fixed number of computers, that's constant. Capital is fixed. But just by increasing our understanding, our knowledge, our skills, we can increase our productivity, increase the amount of stuff we're able to produce, and thus increase our GDP per person, income per person, expenditure per person, output per person. So that being said, a increase in education, again, a big boost there. Of course, this last one, again, we have just kind of, a, it's a function of our technology and labor, or given our technology and labor, technology per labor. Again, how much technology do we have per person out there? Uh, this is this is actually kind of a bit of a interesting thing, right? And that is to talk about it, we really have to talk about, we have to define what is technology, right? What is technology? What do we mean when we say, hey, technology or technology per worker? Like, isn't computers, isn't computers, isn't that technology? Isn't an iPad technology? So, hey, wait, wait. If a computer is technology, 
wasn't that capital. Ah, so what exactly do we mean by this technology? So there we go. We said, hey, technology is our biggest determinant here, but we're kind of caught up now. What, what is it? What exactly do we mean by technology? And this is kind of where it gets a little bit fuzzy, but technically what we mean by technology in this sense here is this is this odd concept of disembodied technology. This is technology that's just kind of floating out there in the ether, if it were. And that's like, what? that makes no sense. Well, if we want to think about the alternative, right, as we create new capital, as we create new tools, equipment, all of this, all of these new capital, they embody, they embody new technology inside of them, right? A new computer, a computer released this year is going to be faster, is going to be sharper, is going to be altogether better than a computer built five years ago. Same idea, our human capital, the education that you receive as you move through courses, as you move through your degree today, is going to be vastly different than the education you would have received 10, 20 years ago. In that sense there, your education is embodying new technologies, new understandings of the world around us. So we have embodied technology in our capital, in our human capital. So what exactly do we mean by this disembodied technology? Well, this is really hard to kind of visualize. This is really hard to really explain. It is near impossible to measure. What we're really getting at with this is ultimately any increase in our output that really cannot be explained. That cannot be explained by an increase in labor, capital, or human capital. That is, hey, we've had increases in these outputs, but we've had even more increase here. That is, ah, there's something going on that we really can't explain by these inputs, our factors of production something that can't be explained. What, what is that? What is affecting this guy? Well, that thing that's affecting this guy, we would just say that that is technology. That is often it is measured as a residual, as a leftover, as what we really can't explain. We measure all of this stuff. We measure this stuff. We relate them to each other. And the difference, this residual, we give that this name of technology, that, hey, this is the amount or change in our productivity or change in our, ultimately, our productivity due to technology. And as tough as that is to explain, that is our primary driver, our primary growing, primary thing that grows our real GDP and our real GDP per person. So this whole idea of disembodied tech, as odd as that is. But let's clear it up a little bit. Let's just talk about not necessarily embodied, disembodied tech. That gets rather abstract. Let's just talk generically what do we mean in economics when we talk about technology and new technology. Roughly, roughly we can break technology into three different categories. First, we can break it into new products. And this is often what people think about when they think about new technology. That is, hey, we got some new crazy way of having wireless headphones. Hey, that's a new product that never used to exist. Everything used to be wired. So that's new technology. We have new smaller computers. Hey, that's a new product. That's new technology. Uh, we invented augmented reality. We created glasses that overlay our field of vision with different kind of views. Again, new product, new technology. This is typically what we think about, our new vaccines, our new medicine, all of that, new products. But that's not all of it. That's not all of it. We would also include, as new technology, we would include new production methods, new ways of producing things. So this could actually take a few different forms. This could just be, this could be a new management technique. 
right? This could be the adoption of our kind of our Toyota method, the lean management technique, as it were, as was first pioneered by Toyota and revolutionized the management world and resulted in great increases of productivity for Toyota and has been attempted to have been mimicked or copied by many other firms since. We'd take that as a new technology. It would also be new training methods, new training methods. So, hey, this could be new ways of going through school. This could be new training methods within a firm. This is training you how to do a job. Uh, this could be many different ways to essentially increase your human capital through new avenues. Well, all of that would be considered a new technology. It's a new approach, and if it changes our level of output, all else equal, well, it'd be a new technology that exists. So that's kind of chicken scratch there. That's new training methods. We could finally look at, for our new methods, we could be taking a look at new production methods. New production methods. And, and what exactly do we mean by that? Well, this could be a new way of producing. Maybe we've taken a look at our production method and we realized, wow, there's a lot of waste going on. We have a lot of just extra scrap. Maybe we could take all that extra scrap, we could utilize it to create a new product. Or maybe we can change our blueprints, we can change our plans so that we don't make as much scrap. Given the same raw resources, the raw materials going in, given this new production method, we've been able to increase our outputs. Maybe these new production methods are just new ways of organizing our shop floor, right? Putting things that are similar, like, hey, this then flows into that, so we put them closer together so we don't have as much transit time. All of this, new production methods. We'll then see as we work through this that there's actually a lot of crossover between these different types of technology. That is, new products over into creating new methods. For example, we see coming on and arguably a big change that we might witness is the rise of 3D printing. So with the rise of 3D printing and utilizing 3D printing as a production method, well, as we kind of talked about, traditional production is destructive. You start off with something large and you whittle it down, you destroy it to get your final product. Well, 3D printing goes the other way. You start off with just liquid or near liquid raw material and you use almost, there's a little bit of waste, but you utilize almost everything that you need. You don't have any waste. You just build up. There's no destruction along the way. So in that way there, really revolutionizes production. And if you're interested in that, you can take a look. There's a lot of really interesting ways that 3D printing is being utilized or being hypothesized to be utilized in the future, including 3D printing housing changing our residential construction. Uh, so that could be a huge boom to the industry there. Again, just some examples as we go through. No way is this list exhaustive. Final one that we could look at would be new inputs. So new inputs, this could be new labor. This could be new capital. This could be new raw materials. Right, and to start at the bottom and work our way up. So new raw materials, this would be, hey, the steel we use in production today is fundamentally different than the steel we used 20, 30, 40 years ago. It's stronger, it's lighter, it's easier to make, right? Through engineering breakthroughs, we've created better ways to use the resources, the materials around us. So changing these inputs into our production process, these raw materials can greatly change our amount of output. New capital, right? We've already talked about this. This is kind of our embodied technology. New computers, well, they're going to be faster. They're going to be easier to use. All of this, new interfaces. All of these new inputs, they embody new technology with them. New labor, well, hey, all this new labor, they're people. They have different life experiences. They have different skill sets that they have developed through their life experiences. All of those new inputs. And right in that, we could also throw in human capital, new education, all of that was new input into our production process, embodying technology in it. So all of that to say, when we talk about technology and economics, we're not just talking about these new products, we're talking about an array of things. And right, ultimately, ultimately, there's a lot of crossover.
new products. Sometimes these new products, they get utilized as new raw materials, as an input into the next line of production processing. So they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive lists here. There's a lot of crossover between them. Often, right, new labor, new human capital, new capital, often these can result in, sorry, new production methods that weren't previously available to us. Say an example of this would be the move from our cottage industry producing to our factory production as we witnessed in the Industrial Revolution. So these aren't mutually exclusive lists. Lots of flow between all the different categories. So again, that's what we're getting at when we mean technology. Okay, that being said, again to reiterate, as we said a few times now, technology, that is found to be the key driving force of growth. Let's, let's write that down. Technological growth is the key driving force of economic growth. So the two, the two are intricately linked to one another. But... Why? Why do we have technological growth? Why do we have new technologies? What causes this new technology, right? Why do we keep advancing in this technological in new technologies? What's going on there? So let's take a look at a few different theories that exist as to why we have new technologies and why we have technological advancement. First of all, first theory as to why we have technological advancement, well, we witness technological advancement just due to exogenous, that's not how you spell exogenous, let's try that again, exogenous impacts. That is, hey, technology is constant. It's maybe increasing in very incremental small steps. And then all of a sudden, boom, from outside of our system, we have either just somebody who is revolutionarily smart and sees the world a different way, or we have some external impact that just hits us and fundamentally allows a drastic change in technology. Does this happen? Yeah, this happens all the time. Unfortunately, typically when we talk about exogenous impacts, exogenous changes to technology, this is due to war, disease, um, crisis, right? Typically it is big kind of problems that are facing humanity on whole and we rally together and we create new technologies to overcome it. Um, interestingly enough, war tends to be one of the big ones that really results in a lot of technological improvement. Uh, nothing really brings us together to overcome problems like killing one another. So one of our big kind of contributors to exogenous changes. Crises, same kind of idea, um, disease to a degree as well. I mean, we see that here. The vaccine that's currently being launched for uh, COVID, it was developed over a weekend. Uh, we had that vaccine in place before the first case even showed up on U.S. soil. Mind you, it took months to get through the regulatory process. Probably a good thing with that, but huge exogenous impact. We have this crisis. We have this disease that has a huge threat to humanity. and all of our focus went on that and boom, we were able to utilize this new vaccine method. So exogenous things just causing us, forcing us to make big changes in technology. To a degree, we would also say that technological progress, technological advancement is path dependent. That is certain technologies are not possible without previous other technologies. And once we find one way to do something and we become really good and efficient at it, we continue with that one as we move through. So examples of this, for example, of this path dependency is in one way, we couldn't have modern computing without first understanding and having discovered electricity and how to harness and utilize electricity. Another kind of example of path dependency is the early days of the, of the automobile. In the early days, we had both gasoline and electric vehicles. However, between the two, we were, we were able to harness, we were able to create efficient vehicles that were better using gasoline, internal combustion, and we were able to develop this technology 
faster, more cost effective than we were electric vehicles. As a result of that, future technological progresses in the case of vehicles went along the route of internal combustion. It was not until recently, due to crisis, that we've had to go back and we've had to look at creating new technologies or overcoming technological hurdles to go back and taking a look at electric vehicles. So a jump there and we see that there's a bit of path dependency. The technologies that we adapt, that we adopt, the technologies we move forward with do influence which ones will come next as we move through. Finally, and arguably the biggest contributor to technological development, biggest one here is ultimately the fact that we have profit maximizing firms. And that is these profit maximizing firms, they are constantly competing with one another. They're constantly trying to outdo one another. And in doing so, they're looking to adopt new technologies that will either A, create new products that they can sell with a monopoly, allowing great levels of profits, or B, adopting new technologies that lower their costs of production. So, hey, as you lower your costs, all else constant, you have your revenues, you have your costs. If your costs drop for the same revenue, your profit grows. So profit maximizing firms being a key source of technological advancement because new technologies, if properly adopted, can mean new, better, higher levels of profit. And let's take a look at really how this whole profit maximization works and how firms end up choosing if they have an array of technologies available to them, well, how do they choose which one to adopt, right? An example for this to kind of put into context, hey, BC Ferries recently has just decided to buy a whole bunch of ferries that run off of natural gas. Why? There are other technologies available to them. They could have switched to a nuclear ferry. We use, hey, nuclear submarines. They could have switched to, as they did, natural gas. They could have also switched to purely electric submarines. We're getting to that point now where we have the ability to have large enough batteries to hold the power needed to utilize an electric ferry, strictly electric, powered from the grid. Why did they choose to go along the routes of natural gas? Well, I don't know. I'm not part of BC Ferries, but ideally there was a cost benefit done. Ideally, there was a process done along the lines of what we're going to look at to explain why typically firms adopt the technologies they do. So let's take a look at an example of this. Well, let's suppose that a firm is looking at, uh, they're going to have their ability, how much capital they're going to utilize in their production and how much labor they're going to utilize in their production. Keep in mind, what we can presume is that, hey, anywhere, any level of production being produced is going to have some cost associated with it. And there's going to be some cost of capital, there's going to be some cost of labor, as right, your labor would be your wage, your capital would be the cost of renting or the opportunity cost of what you could have rented that capital out for. As a result, what you would get as you go through this is you would get some kind of line such that any point on these lines would all have the same cost of production. That is, if I were to use all labor at this point, or if I were to use all capital at this point, along this line is representing that it would be the exact same cost of production. That is, we would call this line some level of capital, some level of labor connecting together with the same cost. We would call it an ISO cost curve. So what we would want to evaluate is we would want to evaluate for a group of technologies, what would be their corresponding ISO costs, and we would want to find the technology with the lowest ISO cost, the lowest cost of production given some combination of labor and capital. So let's take a look at how exactly we would do that. Let's presume that we have, okay, capital, labor, we'll get to creating our, our ISO cost. Let's presume that we have 
for this, we have, let's say, five different technologies. So five different technologies for us to choose from, and each one requires a different amount of labor and a different amount of capital to produce however many units we're producing. That is, we're going to presume that they all are able to produce the same quantity, maybe 100 units worth of stuff, with some level of labor, some level of capital. And we'll call these technologies, let's kind of make some lines so that I can kind of try to follow along. So that'd be one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, so we would have technology, we'll call it technology A, B, C, D, and E. And let's presume that technology A would be able to produce their 100 units using two workers and six units of capital. Uh, technology B would be able to produce using five workers and two units of capital. C would be nine and one. D would be three and eight. And E would be seven and five. So what we can do is we can utilize our diagram, we can take a look at all these different technologies and we can go from there. So let's start off with our labor. I'm gonna give it a rough kind of scale. Let's say right there is something like 10, so cut that in half. That's gonna be five. And then let's see, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Ah, a bit of a rough scale here, right? Same thing on the vertical capital. Again, highest capital is eight, so let's cut that at 10. Again, in half with five, and roughly one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so let's start off. Let's start off taking a look at technology A. and. Let's see, do I have enough colors to do it this way? I think I do. So D will be green and E will be yellow. So starting off with technology A would be two and six, giving us something about there as our combination of labor and capital needed to produce our number of units. Technology B would allow us to produce the same amount with five labor and two capital. And then C, we'll go to blue for that, needs nine and one. So lots of labor, not very much capital. D, what's going on with D? That needs three and eight. So that's going to be somewhere up here. And then finally, E is seven and five. So seven and five, something as such. So we need to start working through this and we need to figure out, okay, which technology ultimately are we going to want to adopt? And the way we can start by looking at this is saying, hey, can we rule out any technologies? And the way we can work through that is, I mean, I'm going to jump back to white for this, is we can take a look at a technology and say, okay, technology A, that was two and six. So, hey, two workers all the way up, six capital all the way over. Anything within this area, that is, hey, this guy right here is needing more labor and more capital. That is, it's altogether going to be a more costly technology. That is, we can say with certainty that A is going to dominate D. We can just ignore D, essentially. We're going to say, hey, whatever technology D, whatever technology D is, technology A is going to be better. We can do the same thing going through all of these. Ah, uh, this guy here. Technology B, we see that technology B dominates technology E. So again, well, we can ignore that one. And then what about technology C? Uh, technology C, nothing up in this area here. So C doesn't dominate anything. But what we've been able to do in this is at least we've been able to say, a, D, and E, we're never going to consider these technologies. No matter what's happening, these technologies are going to be more expensive. We can ignore them going forward. Okay, let's clean up this whole 
what technology has dominated what technology side of things. And let's work through which technology we will ultimately end up adopting. So let's just quickly clean up. Okay. So as of which technology we're ultimately going to adopt, the adoption of technology really depends on relative prices. And in this case here, this is going to be the relative prices of our inputs. So that is going to be the relative price of labor to capital. If labor is really cheap comparative to capital, well, if we have really cheap labor, Having lots of workers and just a little bit of capital, that could be a really solid technology. If capital is really cheap in relation to labor, that is wages are really high, but it's really cheap to get equipment, well, something like very few workers and lots of machines could be an effective technology to use. Which one is entirely dependent on these relative prices? And what we'll take a look at is a situation where, hey, given one relative price, one technology prevails. We change those relative prices and a different technology will prevail. This here helps to explain why certain technologies were adopted by different countries, by different economies at different times. Because in different regions, labor and capital was valued differently and based off of the relative valuation of each of them, different technologies were adopted. So an idea a model that we can utilize to say, hey, how come this technology was adopted here, but not there, and et cetera, et cetera. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at our wage. I'm just going to call this the price of labor and our rent, that is our price of capital. Let's suppose just for simplicity, that price of labor is five. And our price of capital, we're going to say our capital is more expensive. We're going to say the price of capital is 10. Again, we don't need to worry about D and E. We already saw those ones were dominated by A and B, so we can just rule them out all together. What we can work at next is we can work out our total cost of production. And so to take a look at our total cost of production, we can say, hey, I have two workers at $5 a worker. So two times five plus six units of capital at $10 per capital, so 2 times 5 plus 6 times 10 gives me a total cost of production of 70, right? And this would be perhaps in dollars as price of labor and price of capital. Similarly, we work through, uh, we get 5 times 5 plus 2 times 10. We're going to get a total cost of 45. And then 9 times 5 plus 1 times 10, we're going to get a cost of 55. Just to show that these guys were in fact dominated, we could work those out as well. They would have been 95 and 85 respectively. So very clearly higher than any of these three. Okay, looking at this, we can just take a look and we can say, hey, total cost, what's my lowest cost of production? And we take a look and we say, hey, 45, that's our lowest cost of production. There we go. Technology B, that is the one we're going to choose. Cheapest cost of production for the same amount of output, sold at the same price, meaning, hey, I get the highest level of profit I possibly can. So which technology do I adopt in this case? Technology B. We can also take a look at this with ISO costs and show, in fact, that it does have the lowest ISO cost. And that is, how do we exactly get this isocost curve? Well, keep in mind when we drew that isocost curve before, it went all the way from, hey, if we produced it with pure labor or all the way producing it with pure capital, it had the same cost. So in this case here, hey, how many, how many workers would I need to have a total cost of 45? So that is if I go 45 divided by 5, I get 9. So to the other side, which would be 45 divided by our price of capital of 10 of 4.5. So sorry, I think in the first one I said 45 divided by 5 point to our labor here. No, 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 no. 45 divided by my price of labor, 5, right? Giving me how many workers I would have in that case. So 
what we've just done is we've said, okay, on one extreme, I would have nine. On the other extreme, I would have 4.5. If I did my scale good, all of these points should all fall in the same line. We see ah, my scale is not quite perfect. We can change that. We can change that. We can take that line and we can put it up on our ISA cost. So right there, that would be our ISA cost of 45. We would similarly do our ISA costs for our other ones there. Let's go take a look at technology C. Technology C, we have a total cost of 55. So 55 divided by my price of labor. So 55 divided by, again, 5 gives me 11 workers. So that would be somewhere like that. And then on the other side, if I were to do it with all capital, 55 divided by 10 would give me about 5.5. So again, if I connect these, they should, oh, that one's much better. They actually do all fall on the same line. And that is an ISA cost of 55, such that along this line, whatever level of labor and capital I have would all cost me 55. Finally, technology A. Well, for technology A, if we did all workers, so 70 divided by the price of labor, five, that's going to give me all the way out. Maybe something like that is 14. 70 divided by 10 would mean 10, seven pieces of capital. Draw that, and I get my ISA cost for A at 70. Now, we didn't need to do this, right? We already just by looking at the total cost worked out that B was in fact the best technology to adopt. What we see by looking at these ISA costs is just really a confirmation that in fact B was our lowest cost. It was the ISA cost that was closest to the origin and thus the best technology for us to adopt in this scenario. But what were to happen if our relative prices were to change? If our relative prices were to be different, could another technology be the one we want to adopt? So let's back up. Let's take a look at that. And let's see as relative prices change, does our choice, does our adoption of technology change as well? That is, maybe labor is really expensive. If labor is really expensive in this other scenario, do we pick other technologies? So Let's take a look at that. Let's clean up what we've worked here and let's restart given new prices. So let's clean up. So in this case, let's not do anything fancy. Let's just switch our price of labor and our price of capital. So instead of five for labor and 10 for capital, we're just going to switch them around. Labor now costs 10, capital now costs five. So 10, 10, five, and five. Again, we can work through our total costs in this case. So hey, 2 times 10 plus 6 times 5, and we would get 50, 60, and 95. And we don't need to worry about those guys. We already saw that they're going to be dominated by the other three no matter what. Again, in this case, we can take a look. Given our new relative prices, we can identify our lowest cost of production, which is going to be 50 in this case. And so given this change in relative prices, we now have a different technology that we would adopt. A different technology that would now be profit maximizing by being least cost, by minimizing our costs, right? Producing in a least cost fashion. That's what I was trying to say. Okay. Again, if we wanted to take a look at our ISA costs, if we wanted to create an ISA cost just to confirm this and say, hey, is in fact technology A the lowest ISA cost available to us, we would do the same kind of idea. We'd say, okay, if we were to produce with purely labor, so at $10 per worker, total cost of 50, so 50 divided by 10 would give me five. On the other side, 50 divided by five, if I did all capital, would give me 10. So again, if I draw a line between those two, if things are roughly to scale, they're not terrible, but that's a little bit off. We can correct it. There we go. That would be my ISA cost for technology A at a cost of 50. Very similarly, what about technology B? 
Well, if I did it all workers at a cost of 60, so hey, 60 workers cost $10 a worker, so I'd be at six workers. On the other side, I'd be at 12 capital, something along the lines of that. And I would have my new ISOCOST. Oh, wrong tool. Let's fix that up. New ISOCOST at 60 there. Very similarly, I can go along again. I can take a look at 95. And 95, well, that's going to be on the one extreme, 9.5 all the way out to... 95 divided by my price of capital of 519 on the other side. You'll see that that's actually quite a bit higher and all the way out there. In fact, in this scenario, if we work it through, we can tell just by that that in fact, technology C, even though D and E were dominated by A and B, we can see that given those relative prices now, Technology C is going to be a higher cost than D and E. And we can quickly double check that, right? We can quickly double check that. 3 times 10 plus 8 times 5. That is technology D would have had a total cost of 70. Still higher than A and B, right? A and B still dominated. We knew that. But, hey, it actually beats out C. Keep in mind, when we were looking at domination, C didn't dominate anything. Final one there, 7 and 5. So 7 times 10 plus 5 times 5. There we have 95, meaning that, okay, technically where E should fall if my scale was right, technically E should fall right on this line as well. So clearly my scale is not perfect, hence why technology E doesn't fall in line with technology C in this case. But if we had the same costs, they should fall on that same ISA cost line. Uh, let's see if I can line that up. Seven and five, that'd be something like that in that case. So we see how we can utilize ISA costs to kind of evaluate least cost technologies. And that is in this case, given this change in relative prices, now would be technology A that we adopt. So all of that to say, yes, even if we had a world with all technologies available to all peoples everywhere, we would still have economies potentially choosing different technologies to produce with, focusing on one, focusing on a different one. And the reason behind that being the relative prices in that local economy. Due to the cost of inputs, the factor prices, that is primarily labor and capital, but there are other raw inputs as well to consider, given the relative prices between them, we will choose different technologies such that we are able to produce at the least cost method, and thus those relative prices are a determining factor of technology, and thus which technologies we choose and expand and grow with. So... All of that to show a model of technological choice. So in summary, what have we taken a look at in this video? To start off with, we've taken a look at one model of looking at GDP. We said, hey, we need to have a government that maintains this monopoly of violence, that has a rule of law, and has these property rights. By having that, at minimum, we can have a functioning economy. We can have growth. We can have firms actually engaging in economic activity. From there, we took a look at our production, uh, kind of our production function model. And we said, hey, production, that is our output, our real GDP, is some function of technology, labor, capital, and human capital. We took a look at how that influences our GDP. We divided all of that by workers to get our kind of GDP per capita model of that. And we saw that, hey, if we only increased workers, all else constant, our GDP per capita would actually fall. And then we went and started talking about technology and kind of the bits with technology, embodied, disembodied technology, and really what we mean as economists when we talk about technology and really what it is, what it isn't. From there, we finished off taking a look at causes of technological growth. There are others, of course, that I didn't get to, but the three that we kind of looked at quickly were exogenous events, so just 
hey, we're going along fine, and then all of a sudden we were hit by something out of the blue. We had to rally together to solve the problem, and boom, we created a new technology to do so. War, disease, crises being big ones in the past that have been examples of these exogenous events. We also took a look at the fact that, hey, technology was path dependent. Previous technologies we have chosen influence the next technology we end up developing or how we continue the progression of that technology as we saw with the first adoption of internal combustion engines and the progression, the increasing efficiency of our use of those. That is to a degree, right, scientific progress, all of that, it's often said we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Very rarely do we reinvent the whole wheel. We just make these incremental steps forward from it. We finished off by taking a look at the fact that, hey, firms are profit maximizing. This whole desire to get the highest level of profit they can leads to new innovations, leads to research and development. This desire to create new products or to lower their costs of production leads to the development or the adoption of new technologies. And here we finished off with a quick look at a model to kind of say, hey, why does a firm choose? Why does a firm adapt to one technology over another technology? And the explaining factor here was relative prices of inputs and how different relative prices will influence different technologies to be chosen. Okay, that does us for this video. If you have any questions on anything we covered off on this, feel free to comment below feel free to post to D2L, and of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks. Until next time.